On today's show, the Houston Rockets finishing strong at home behind an all-star caliber performance from Fred Van Vliet. How the defense absolutely shut down and frustrated Paolo Bancaro, one of Jabari's best games of the season, and so much more. It's all coming up on today's Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. The Houston Rockets went out with a bang against the Orlando Magic, their final home game of this season. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian, a credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube, where the best way you can help the show out is to comment anything tell us your thoughts on this game Fred Van Vliet's performance the Rockets defense give me your thoughts in the YouTube comments now today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. And as always, thanks so much for making Locked On Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on your way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym. Thank you for being an everydayer. Now you might catch yourself saying. Jackson, this game happened a couple days ago. Why are you talking about it now? Well, I dealt with some tech issues, unfortunately, and I'm only just now back up and running. And this game deserved to be talked about. The final home game of the regular season. And I think this game was important for a variety of reasons. One, it ended that little five-game skid that the Rockets were on. This is a very good Orlando Magic team. Yes, they were without Franz Wagner in this game. The Rockets are still missing a good chunk of their roster. So it's not exactly, you know, tit for tat, but it it's still, you know, it's still an impressive win nonetheless. And it was nice for the Rockets to be able to end on a good note, at home at Toyota Center, right? It would have left kind of a bad taste in your mouth to end the final game of the regular season at home uh, with a loss against a team that is at least on a similar trajectory as you are as far as being a young, you know, upstart team, impressive jump in wins this year, all that stuff. So, you know, I want to kind of compare and contrast a little bit later on how different this Rockets team looked playing this Orlando Magic team, the team that they very first played way early on. The first game of the regular season was against this exact Magic team and how different this Rockets squad looked now compared to earlier this season. But where we have to start first is the impressive performance by Fred Van Vliet. The Rockets won this game 118-106, and they do not win this game without the all-star caliber performance of Fred Van Vliet, who dropped a season-high 37 points on 13 of 22 shooting. He was 6 of 11 from downtown, 5 of 6 at the free throw line. He had eight rebounds, six assists, a steal, and a block, only two turnovers in his 38 minutes of run. He was a plus 21 Plus 21 in this game in a 12-point win, which means the Rockets were minus 9 in the minutes that Fred Van Vliet was not on the basketball floor. That's how impressive his play was in this game. So the 10 minutes that Fred didn't play on the court, the Rockets were not doing so hot. This was, I think, an encapsulation of what Fred Van Vliet has brought to this Rockets team and, and how he really had stepped up this year and and filled a niche, provided exactly what this Rockets team needed. And when we look back and when we eventually dive in and do our season reviews for you know the players up and down the roster and kind of just reviewing the season in its totality, I think when we go back and look at what our expectations were for Fred Van Vliet coming in and how he far exceeded those expectations, this is what we're going to remember is is games and moments like this and not just the big scoring games, right? But everything in between. Yeah, he had an incredible performance. He dropped 37 points. The Rockets needed all 37 of those points with Jalen Green struggling a little bit offensively, more on his play a little bit later on. But Fred has been whatever this team has needed him to be all season long. He's stepped up to the table and been a playmaker. He's been a floor general. He has been a bucket getter. He's been a guy who can calm things down and get them, you know, a clutch bucket here or there when absolutely needed. He did so in this game. So first off, Fred had a massive first quarter, a 15 point first quarter on six of eight shooting from the floor. He was absolutely on fire out of the gate. He hit multiple, like, 
tightly contested layups early in this game, including the one where he went up and under like under the basket kind of, you know, did the reverse and flipped it up off the glass. It looked like it like hit like the top of the backboard and somehow dropped in to the basket. Um, he seriously was, was hitting some insane shots early in this game, got off to a really hot start and just over the rest of the game, over the, you know, second, third and fourth quarters, <clears throat> He just stepped up in big ways when this team needed him to, right? When the Orlando Magic kind of made a push in the third quarter to get back into this game, Fred Van Vliet kind of calmed things down, hit a couple very key buckets. The Magic cut it to a six-point game, 97-91. The Rockets only leading by six. Uh, and Fred Van Vliet hit a huge three-pointer to give the Rockets a little bit more breathing room, right? And that's just kind of what he has provided to this team. He's provided all the intangibles, the veteran leadership, the work ethic, all of that, and that's gone a really long way with all these young guys, right? His presence both on the court to calm things down and off the court in the locker room, teaching these guys winning habits, how to be winning players, and... Then you look at his impact on the court, right? The Rockets were so turnover prone last year. That was one of the is- the biggest issues for this team is lack of ball security. And to go from what this team had last year to this season where now the Rockets take care of the basketball almost better than anybody else in the NBA. They don't turn the ball over. And even against a very good defensive Orlando Magic team, they only had 12 turnovers, right? This is a Magic team that loves to force turnovers, that loves to blow things up defensively using their size, using their length. And yet the Rockets did a really good job taking care of the basketball. Aside from, you know, uh, for the four turnovers that Amin Thompson had, it didn't really feel like there was an egregious display of constant turnovers or constant ball pressure or anything like that. The Rockets did a really good job of taking care of the basketball. And a big part of that is Fred Van Vliet and how much command he has over the basketball and how careful he is with setting up plays and taking great care of the basketball and putting guys in the right spots. And I just, I think back to a lot of the uh, off-season reactions and, and you know, preseason reactions from specifically Raptors fans who seemingly wanted to blame Fred Van Vliet for everything that went wrong with last year's team, who wanted to blame Fred Van Vliet for taking away shots from the young guys and not being a team player and, and all this stuff. And that, the version of Fred Van Vliet that's here in Houston could not be further from whatever this caricature of him that they made him out to be in Toronto, you know, I just, it, it just, it kind of feels like, you know, the whole, like you break, uh, you know, your, your, your girlfriend breaks up with you. So then you're like, no, you're not breaking up with me. I'm breaking up with you. We didn't want you here anyways, like throwing all that slander and everything. Like, I don't know. Fred has been incredible for these young guys, right? I, I don't think we see Shingoon or Jalen or Jabari make the strides that they did in their game or, or even, you know, Amin and Cam, the way that they those guys have played as rookies this season. I don't think you see any of that take place, at least not to the degree that it has, without Fred Van Vliet and his steadying hand, his leadership, his impact on the court, his ability to be a chameleon and change his game and do whatever he needs to do for this team to be able to win. If that means he plays more off ball, like he has as of late with Jalen green, handling the basketball more offensively and initiating more offense. Great. He's capable of doing that. If it means taking over a game and scoring and, and really putting the onus on the other team to defend him, then that's the case. In this game, the Magic really tried to shut down Jalen Green, right? They put their best defender and Jalen Suggs on Jalen Green, and they tried to slow him down. And yeah, it, it might have worked a little bit on Jalen Green, but it left Fred Van Vliet very open to do a lot of damage offensively and a lot of damage he did with his 37 points. Wanted to make sure we highlighted how important his game was here, how crucial he was to this final home game, final game at Toyota Center this season. I want to get a, get into a little bit of the game flow here, how the Rockets jumped out to a early lead in that first quarter, the defensive approach on Paolo Bancaro, as well as other thoughts from this game, including Jabari Smith Jr., an incredible all-around game from him, uh, hopefully a strong close to the season after a really impressive year to jump in his overall play. We're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. 
Game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. They've got killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Look, I don't know about you. My least favorite thing when I'm buying tickets, it could be to go to a game, to go to a concert, whatever is you're going through the whole process and then at the very end, they try to surprise you with all these like handling fees and digital service fees and, and, and all this stuff. You end up paying more in fees or as close to, you know, in fees as for the actual tickets. It's ridiculous. That doesn't happen with a game time. They show you their all-in pricing from the jump so you know exactly how much you're paying for your tickets. They've got so many deals that you want to take advantage of. Last minute deals, flash deals, zone deals, all sorts of things because they're obsessed with saving you money on tickets. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on nba for 20 dollars off of your first purchase terms apply again create an account and redeem code locked on nba that's l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n nba for 20 dollars off download the game time app today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, let's get into a little bit of the defensive performance here by the Houston Rockets, because unfortunately, during that five game skid, their defense was one of the things that slipped considerably. And it it was really unfortunate because this Rockets team has been a, a team that, at least for now, is still holding on to a top 10 the defensive rating, but, you know, has watched that slip over the last, you know, week and a half, two weeks or so over that five game losing streak. And the defense was concerning, right? This is a team that has, you know, made defense its entire, entire identity for much of this season. So seeing them get back to a really strong defensive performance against a very good Orlando magic team. Yes. They didn't have Franz Wagner without him out there. The magic are a little bit easier to game plan for offensively. A lot of their offense was, you know, attempting to funnel through Paolo Bancaro. They don't have, the exact same offensive punch or firepower in their starting lineup without Franz Wagner out there. But nonetheless, the Rockets still did a really, really fantastic job shutting down Paolo Bancaro, right? And they did so by sending multiple bodies at him, but they weren't just doubling him on the catch, right? They were waiting. They were waiting for him to try and back into or, or, you know, make a move and get into position. And then they were sending the double teams at him, right? It was almost... I don't want to say a little bit random at times, but depending on how the Rockets were switching kind of dictated how quickly the double team would come. Sometimes there were moments where like Fred Van Vliet would get switched onto Paolo Bancaro and the double would come a lot quicker because Fred is, you know, much, it's more, it's more of a mismatch for Fred trying to D up on Paolo Bancaro than say a Dylan Brooks or a Jabari or an Amin Thompson. So whenever it was Fred or Jalen, you know, stuck guarding Paolo Bancaro and he would kind of put his back to the basket and try to overpower one of those guys. We saw a very quick double team from Dylan or Amin or Jabari, somebody would come over to force the ball out of Paolo's hands. And then if it was one of the other three kind of wings, bigger guys on the roster, by and large, the Rockets were actually pretty content to let those guys D up Paolo one-on-one, but they were still sending a second man over at the last second to really kind of just collapse the defense on top of Paolo Bancaro. There were so many drives in this game where he saw two or three or even four defenders at times just completely collapsing all over him in the paint. They forced him to become a facilitator, and he did a decent enough job. He had six assists in this game, but he also had four turnovers, and he was clearly uncomfortable for a majority of this game. He finished the game just seven of 19 shooting. He missed all five of his three-pointers. Early in the first quarter, I I believe it was the first quarter, he settled for not one, but two three-pointers, I think, in the first quarter that were both just kind of like... He had the ball on the perimeter, and you could tell that he just really didn't want to go get double teamed by making a move and stepping inside the three-point arc. So instead of like actually doing anything offensively to try to get downhill and get to his spots on the floor, he just settled for pulling up for a wide-open three, or at least a, a three where the defender was kind of sagging off of him a little bit. And so it was just a rough overall night for him, a minus 20 in his 36 minutes played. And I, I really do think you got to give a lot of credit to the Rockets defense, the individual defensive approach too of guys like Dylan Brooks, who were incredibly physical with Paolo throughout the entirety of the game. And this was, this game felt like a far cry from the very first game of the season against this exact same Orlando magic team, right? This was a magic team that very first game of the season, the Rockets just didn't look ready 
for the first probably handful of games this season, right? They started off the season on an 0-3 losing streak, and they probably should have won that game in San Antonio, but I, I, I digress. Against the Magic, they just didn't look ready. They didn't look prepared. And the worst part was they looked completely outmatched because of the Magic's size. And that didn't seem to be the case in this game, which is actually a little bit surprising because the Rockets are actually a smaller team now than they were earlier in the season because they're playing Jabari Smith Jr. at the five. They don't have Alperin Shingun out there anymore. They are a smaller, less physical team than they were earlier in the season. And I just... I, you know, I want to commend them for leaning into the the identity, the toughness, the mentality that Ime Odoka wanted this team to, to adopt. It wasn't there from the jump, but as the season went on and as this team grew and as they got more comfortable in who they are and who Ime wants this team to be, they grew into that identity, right? They have a toughness. They have an edge about them. And when you stack up this version of this Rockets team compared to the version that played on game one of 82 against the Magic on the road in Orlando to start the season, they are so night and day different from how these two teams played. Like the Rockets came out and got absolutely punched in the mouth in that game in Orlando. The Rockets were not ready for the Orlando Magic size. They weren't ready for their physicality. All of that. This game completely different. Again, the Rockets fought hard on the glass. They gang rebounded. They completely flummoxed Paolo Bancaro defensively. He had no answer for them. Yes, some of that comes again with Franz Wagner not being out there, so I'm going to put the little asterisk on it a little bit. But at the same time, the Rockets are still missing so many of their key contributors that I think it more, more or less makes up for them not having Franz out there. So I just wanted to highlight how different this Rockets team kind of felt to start the season versus where they are now. And the Magic still have a very, like, kind of a jumbo lineup. Now, they didn't really run their jumbo lineup to start. They ran a three-guard set to start this game with Jalen Suggs, Gary Harris, and Markel Fultz out there in the starting lineup. So their only two bigs on the floor were Wendell Carter Jr. and Paolo Bancaro. But there were still points during this game where they would have, uh, you know, Mo Wagner out there, Jonathan Isaac out there getting some minutes. This is still a Magic team with a lot of size and a lot of depth to it. And there was even a point where Ime Odoka felt the need to kind of, I guess, match up a little bit with the size of the Magic by running, uh, you know, Jabari, Jeff, Jock, kind of having, you know, a triple big lineup of his own out there, at least for a small stretch in this game to kind of offset the size of this Orlando Magic squad. And and by and large, right, this is a Magic team that prides itself on its rebounding, that prides itself on, you know, crushing the glass, being bigger, stronger, using their length defensively to really mess with you. And it didn't feel like that really bothered the Rockets much in this game. The, the Magic did win the rebounding battle, but not by a ton. It was 42 to 37. Um, and again, defensively, the Rockets didn't turn the ball over a ton, right? That was a big key in this game is just taking care of the basketball, not letting the Magic's length interfere with passing lanes, not committing careless, sloppy turnovers. Um, and then offensively, it helps that the Rockets absolutely shot the light out of the lights out of the basketball. They were on fire from three in this game, 15 of 35, 42 point nine percent um and that's a lot of that defensive intensity right and shutting down Paolo Mancaro is what led to the Rockets having a big lead to start this game 36 25 after the first quarter and then they kind of built on that a little bit they kind of basically kept the scoreboard moving more or less the rest of the way 27 26 in the second quarter 34 31 in the third quarter and then it wasn't until the fourth quarter where the Magic actually finally won a quarter uh 24 to 21 it, Rockets jumped out to a big lead in the first quarter. They built that lead up to as much as 19 at you know various points throughout the game. And there were moments where the Magic kind of fought themselves back in, carved, you know, would cut the lead down, trim it down a little bit. Um, but the Rockets always had an answer. And that was the good part. That was the great part about this game is the Rockets, every single time it felt like the Orlando Magic were making a push, the Rockets would lock back in defensively, get some stops, uh, generate some buckets on the offensive end, some really good offense being generated in this game, some really fantastic ball movement in this one. Uh, the Rockets had 29 assists on 45 made shots. It really felt like they were doing a great job moving the basketball around the perimeter. All the starters with at least a handful of assists apiece. You look down the lineup, Jabari Smith Jr., five assists. Amin Thompson, four assists. Dylan Brooks, three assists. Fred, six assists. Jalen, five assists. Um, 
even the bench guys really moving the basketball. Jock Landale had four assists. Jeff Green had a couple of assists. So a really collective effort by everybody. It wasn't just one or two guys. It wasn't just Fred or Jalen collapsing the defense and generating opportunities, although they did that a fair bit in this game as well, getting some hockey assists and kind of starting the offensive movement that way. It wasn't just one of those guys leading to an easy kick out, boom, shot. It was a lot of moving the basketball around the perimeter and using ball movement to generate some wide open looks uh, offensively against, again, a very good Orlando Magic defense. But coming up, I want to definitely touch on Jabari Smith Jr.'s game in this one, an incredible all-around performance from him. We'll talk about Cam Whitmore, his rookie moment, his ejection, getting into it with Joe Ingles, as well as Jalen Green's play in this one. We're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by Better Help. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small, certain things can really start to get to you. And it's important to let that stuff out, especially to someone who's unbiased when it comes to your life. Now, look, you know, I don't, it could be something, maybe something happened at work, you made a mistake or your boss kind of chewed you out. That can always kind of weigh on you and that stuff can, can really suck. Or maybe it's something in your personal life, right? It could be a close friend or a loved one that you have a disagreement with and you don't really know how to you know, work those things out. It can, be, it can be a very fine line to walk when it's somebody that you care about so deeply, but you're having kind of an internal conflict with. So when it comes to therapy, therapists can help you walk through some of these things, right? Having an unbiased third party to sit there and kind of walk you through and explain things from an outsider's perspective can really help to illuminate things in your own life and figure out, okay, well, this is where you can make some adjustments or make some concessions or come to a compromise with whoever it is that you're that you're arguing with or whatever it is that's going on in your life. I've done therapy in, in the past and I found it to be an incredibly cathartic experience that's helped me work through some of my own problems. So if you're thinking about trying therapy, give better help a chance. Therapy can be different for everyone. And honestly, most of us have bigger problems than what's going on with our favorite sports teams. And it's important to get those things off your chest. So try therapy with better help. It's entirely online designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off of your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on NBA. And a final segment here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Fred Van Vliet had a monster performance, of course, with the 37 points, but Jabari Smith Jr. was the second most productive Rocket offensively in this game, finishing with 23 points on 9 of 17 shooting. He was 3 of 5 from behind the three-point line, only hit a couple free throws, but he was 2 of 2 there at the line. He had 7 rebounds, 5 assists, and 2 blocks in his 41 minutes of play. And again, this has been an interesting experiment for the Rockets, for Ime Doka, and for Jabari Smith Jr. running him as the five man, because at least as it stands right now, it doesn't feel like Jabari is necessarily ready to be a full-time five, but it's been really nice to just see the different ways that the Rockets have utilized him during this stretch, especially offensively. And it really felt like in this game, the Rockets did a lot of getting Jabari in very different, like it really felt like we got an all around offensive performance from Jabari. We saw him attack off the catch and drive and finish at the basket with a couple nice finishes. We saw him catching and shooting and spotting up at the three-point line. We saw him picking and popping, whether it was setting a quick screen and then catching the ball on the short roll in the paint and then being able to turn and elevate and get to his jumper there. We saw him get the ball on the low block and back a defender down and try and turn around and hit his kind of patented baseline fadeaway. This was a game where it really felt like we saw almost every version of of Jabari Smith Jr. offensively, all the different ways in which he can be effective offensively. We even saw him uh, break a zone when the Magic were running zone a little bit there in the second half, and the Rockets just, you know, used Jabari as their zone buster, and he's just right there in the middle of the floor. Quick bounce pass down the middle, and Jabari's able to just turn and elevate right there in the mid-range because that's his sweet spot. So loved the way that he was deployed offensively in this game, loved how engaged he was offensively. He needs to become better as a screening presence if the Rockets really want to use him as a full-time five. Um, again, I know that right now, at least, you know, there's kind of a mix between sometimes Jabari is the primary screener, other times Amin has been the primary screener because they both provide different things. Amin Thompson gives you more of that rim running, you know, uh, rolling screening presence where he can catch the ball and get rolling downhill and either make a play out of the middle of the floor for somebody else or try and finish in and around the rim. 
Whereas Jabari is more of that shooting threat where he can pick and pop or catch the ball on the short roll and elevate for a jumper. That way, he's not exactly a, a lumbering, rolling presence, somebody that you want to throw the ball over the top to to finish around the rim. And that's a note that I have for both of these guys. We've talked about this before with Jabari Smith Jr., but I also think it really extends to a Min Thompson is – these guys are guys that are going to have to get better at finishing around the rim. Jabari just needs to get stronger. Like, he just needs to go up and play big when he's around the rim, and there's certain points where he goes up a little soft around the basket and, and gets denied, gets blocked. Um, and those those can be some frustrating moments for sure because when you're 6'11", 7 feet tall, like, you want to be able to be a reliable release valve offensively to where if you get the ball in the paint – off a dump, you know, a, a little a little dump off pass or whatever from one of your guards. They want to know that you can finish it on the inside. Or even if you get an offensive rebound, right, going back up strong with it. And we've seen Jabari do that. We've seen him have moments this season where he plays big and he plays strong. And, you know, we, we just haven't seen, I feel like, that version of Jabari for a little while. I don't know if it's a mentality thing or what, uh, but we've seen him be capable of doing that. It's more just getting him to do it on a consistent basis. And then for Amin Thompson, it feels very reminiscent of Tari Eason's rookie season where they have all the skill in the world, all the physicality, all the physical tools to be able to get right to the rim. And it just feels like an issue of kind of skill, touch, whatever, uh, finesse, being able to actually finish those plays. Because we see him in Thompson get to the rim all the time. Now, he didn't have many issues with it in this game. He was 6 of 7 shooting, 13 points. It's more just a, a you know, 10,000-foot view on Amin Thompson's season, his role in the Rockets' offense, especially since being inserted into the starting lineup. It's just kind of a, a throwaway thought that I had about Amin Thompson and his, you know, ability, or I should say inability at times, to finish around the rim. Now, we've also seen him do some incredible stuff around the rim, so it's not that he's not capable. It's just an area of his game that he's going to have to focus on and refine over time. So, I wanted to highlight, you know, Jabari's game specifically there for a moment. And then even just defensively, right? We've seen Jabari in the past really get up for these these games against his former draft classmates, right? So Paolo Bencaro, Chet Holmgren, these are guys that he was, you know, weighed heavily against at the top of his draft class in 2022. And these are guys that were selected directly in front of him by the two teams that gave him promises. So he always plays with a bit of a chip on his shoulder when going up against these guys. Uh, and that's kind of how it felt in this game against the Magic. You know, he loves getting up for these competitions against Chet, against Palo, and he delivered in a big way in this game. Um, even defensively, again, getting up, had a couple strong blocks, uh, some really great defensive intensity on these switches, uh, really making his presence felt on both sides of the court, I felt like, in this game. A really strong overall game from Jabari, probably one of his better games overall this season, I think. Uh, Jalen Green in this one has been, you know, he's, he's cooled off a little bit from his insane month of March, but it's not the same as earlier this season. And this is what I have to say about it, right? So earlier this season, if Jalen Green would have had a, a 14 point performance on six of 17 shooting, it, it would have felt like he probably wouldn't have been doing enough of all the other things to, Main, to, to be an impact player, right? To still have a strong impact on the game. And yet, in this game, despite his issue shooting the basketball, first off, he was two of nine from three-point land. Just His three ball just really wasn't going in this game, unfortunately. And that can kind of be tough, right? Sometimes you're going to make shots. Sometimes you're going to miss shots. Didn't really have an issue with any of the shots that he was taking. They all can't kind of felt like they came within the flow of the offense or were, you know, more or less good shots, the same shots that he was hitting during his insane, you know, tear in the month of March. So no, no issue there. But was what was really impressive is how, despite his struggles, right, he has really made a name for himself. He's he's launched himself to the top of the opposing scouting report to where now he's still even in a game where he's struggling, he's still commanding soft traps, double teams, right, blitzes from the opposing defense, right? Jalen Suggs is an all-NBA caliber defender this season, right? His point of attack defense has been absolutely insane this year. And they didn't live with just Jalen Suggs, you know, D'ing up on Jalen Green, mano a mano, one-on-one. They were still sending second defenders at Jalen Green to force the ball out of his hands. And he was doing a really good job making the right reads, kicking the ball out, getting it to the open man, and collapsing or, you know, at least scattering the magic defense that way. That was their game plan was they were like, we're not going to let Jalen Green beat us. 
and Jalen Green still kind of beat them with his playmaking. And that's one of the things that we've seen Jalen grow and develop and is becoming a better playmaker. So even though he walked out with just five assists, that doesn't count the number of possessions that he had where he initiated the offense because of the soft trap that the Orlando Magic defense was throwing his way and then getting the ball moving. And again, credit to the rest of the Rockets players on the floor, right? It talked about the facilitating earlier, the 29 assists as a team on 45 made shots. The overall ball movement from the team was incredible to where Jalen Green would start the possession, get the soft double, kick it to the next guy, and then boom, 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 just passing all around the perimeter, right? A lot of possessions where the basketball was just being moved constantly across the floor until it generated a good, high-quality shot. So even though Jalen struggled himself in this game, and, and you know some credit to Jalen Suggs, who, again, I thought played really phenomenal defense on Jalen Green in this game, uh, made his life very difficult, he didn't let that you know, interrupt his ability to still generate good offense for his teammates. He still leveraged his scoring gravity and the double teams that the Magic were sending his way into solid possessions for his teammates. So overall, impressive performance from Jalen, kind of trying to at least counteract the counteract the defensive game plan of the Orlando Magic. And again, because the Magic were sending so much attention to Jalen Green, it really allowed guys like Jabari Smith Jr., like Fred Van Vliet, like Amin Thompson, like Dylan Brooks. It allowed all the other starters to really step up and deliver. And that's what we had seen issues with in the past during, you know, some of the the, the games on the losing streak where you know, against the Timberwolves specifically was a big one where they were sending so much attention to Jalen Green. And when that happens, when a guy gets double teamed, if you're not able to deliver and score out of a double team, because if one guy's getting doubled, that means you have a four on three advantage on the, you know, in the half court elsewhere. And if your guys can't win a four on three advantage offensively, then you're just not likely to win a game if they can't win the majority of their possessions playing four on three basketball. So in this game, the Rockets got their chances to play four on three against the Magic defense because of the double teams on Jalen Green. And this was the game where all the other guys stepped up to deliver while Jalen Green was busy getting shut down. And that's okay. That's what happens to star players sometimes. That was the Magic game plan. They said, we're not going to let Jalen Green beat us. And guess what? All the role players stepped up and beat them instead last thing i want to comment here uh final tip in final thought uh was the interaction between cam whitmore and joe ingles in this game god joe ingles joe ingles is one of those natural irritants right in a game of, of basketball he, he he talks a lot of smack he'll get inside your head a little bit um he's got that old man veteran style play where he's just overly physical and we saw the play. He was kind of, you know, bumping with Cam Whitmore under the basket as, as a shot went up by the Rockets. Cam Whitmore's trying to be in position to, re, in, you know, in position to rebound. Joe Ingles kind of, you know, locking arms with him, kind of threw a, a bit of a shoulder into it, into his side or whatever. So they get locked up, and eventually Cam Whitmore kind of throws an elbow into Joe Ingles' chest to get him off of him, and they teed him up. So they teen him up initially, and they, they, they separate him. They said, calm down. Everybody tried to, you know, relax both sides. <clears throat> they were still jawing back and forth. They were going after it. You know, I don't know if in a moment like that, if you're Emo Doka, if you would rather, like, <clears throat> you know, switch Cam Whitmore onto a different player or whatever, but they stayed guarding each other. And then this is where you saw Cam Whitmore's temper get the best of him, right? And this is where you see a bad, you know, a bad rookie moment from Cam Whitmore. Very next possession, shot goes up by the Jazz, and Joe Ingles has the in, you know inside position on trying to get the offensive rebound. Cam Whitmore's behind him, and Cam just like levels Joe Ingles, like throws like an elbow, like a, a, a like a, just a little little elbow shoulder shove, kind of dips his shoulder into Joe Ingles' back. And, you know, he didn't lay him out. Joe Ingles didn't like crumple or anything, but it was a very clear like targeted hit. Um... And immediately, refs blow the whistles. They, they tee him up. They say, get out of here. And that's just one of those moments where, you know, you have to know better if you're Cam Whitmore. He got frustrated. He was probably maybe a little bit frustrated with his own play. At that point, he was 1 of 4 shooting. He was 0 of 3 from downtown. I'm sure that they were talking a lot of a lot of smack going back and forth. And so Cam just wanted, he just wanted to retaliate. And sometimes you're going to have moments like that as a rookie. We saw it recently with Amin Thompson against the Dallas Mavericks. Um, it happens, right? You have these rookie moments. You grow from it. You learn from it. Um, and like Emo Doka said about Amin Thompson, right, is just, you know, hit him lower next time, right? If you're Cam Whitmore, 
Don't hit him right in front of the referee, you know, one possession after you already had a double technical exchange, right? You made it a really, like, there was a target on your back at that point, and the moment you initiated and did something else, then you were going to get kicked out of the game. At the very least, you could have done something to escalate the conflict to where you both get kicked out of the game, but even then, I don't think that's a fair trade. I think, I, I'm, I'm, you know, Cam Whitmore is more important to the Rockets than Joe Ingles is to the Orlando Magic. At least I, I can I can say that with the utmost certainty, but... On that note, that's going to do it for today's episode. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, a five-star review helps us out a ton. Drop your thoughts about this Rockets' final home game of the season, how good they looked against the Orlando Magic. Only three games left now. Three games left. The Rockets have a very realistic possibility of finishing at 500 or slightly better with these final three games. Give us your thoughts in the YouTube comments. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.